Tonight, a school brawl leads to weapons drawn. Two teenagers stabbed at Bankstown. Bushfire hero Shane Fitzsimmons facing the axe over failures in the state's flood crisis. The leadership battle, the fight to fill the number two job in the state Liberals. Horror on a Queensland cattle station, four people shot, three dead, the gunman on the run. Turning up the tension, Taiwan surrounded by China's military might. Run down and forgotten, new life for a famous Sydney train line. And gold, gold, gold for Australia on a record-breaking final night in the pool. Live from Sydney, 7 News with Mark Ferguson. Good evening. A young love triangle is being blamed for a wild knife fight outside a Bankstown school that left two teenagers with stab wounds. Seven News can reveal a girl could be at the centre of the violence after telling two boys to battle it out for her affections. The bedlam of car horns as boys spill across the road opposite LaSalle Catholic College, Bankstown. Underscoring the immaturity of participants and spectators. There was laughter. This was amusing as two boys were being stabbed. They've got knives, they've got knives. Whoa. Extended batons were used as well as knives and knuckle dusters. Two had what were alleged to be stab wounds, one to the uh, upper back, one to the upper thigh. The victims are 15 and 16, the same ages as six other boys charged with attacking them. Police are hunting four more who ambush the students. I can't believe kids can do that. Terrible. They've got knives, they've got knives. Oh no, they've got knives. Weapons, bro. There. Oh, God. Go and ask them what really happened and, you know, to know whether my kids are safe. That is exactly what he did. From the school's principal, police are investigating the matter and if you are able to assist, I urge you to do so. The root of this conflict started here a week ago, McDonald's Villawood, when two of the boys met for a prearranged fight. 7 News understands a girl is under investigation too, that she told them to fight to win her over. The accused were all given bail. They cannot leave home without parents or guardians, can't see their friends and can't even go to school. Robert Avadia, 7 News. He was considered the hero of the bushfire crisis, rewarded with one of the highest positions in the state. But tonight, Shane Fitzsimmons is facing his own crisis. His job and team at Resilience New South Wales could be abolished after an inquiry into the recent flood response recommended sweeping changes. Two years ago, he was packing up his job as the celebrated Rural Fire Service Commissioner. Could Shane Fitzsimmons be packing the office again? If there are better ways of managing emergencies, responding to emergencies in this country, well then um, that should occur. The government has received the final report into this year's flood disaster. One key but unconfirmed recommendation to dump Fitzsimmons and his agency, Resilience New South Wales. The Premier refusing to confirm. If the report exists and the government's intention is to pursue it, he should release that information. Seven News can exclusively reveal Mr Fitzsimmons today emailed staff to say he's disappointed with the speculation. I need to be abundantly clear. There is no decision of government at this stage. But he admits the report contains recommendations on changes going forward. This year's floods claimed 13 lives, left 4,000 homes uninhabitable. They've lost everything. They've got nothing. We're just PTSD. With a deluge of criticism and questions over the response of Resilience New South Wales. I think the evidence is overwhelming at this point. But Mr Fitzsimmons has been invited to respond to all recommendations. This process is critical as it provides an opportunity for us to correct misunderstandings. Seven News understands the report is 700 pages long, over three volumes, and there is also speculation that it recommends the police take over as the lead disaster agency, absorbing Mr Fitzsimmons' role and and his $800 million budget. That money could be better spent el elsewhere. New South Wales police officers have proven to be the best fit for this particular role. The report to go to Cabinet before any final decision. Chris Reason, 7 News. Transport Minister David Elliott has confirmed last night's 7 News exclusive, saying he will contest the deputy leadership of the state Liberal Party. The former Army captain claims he has the necessary qualifications, but he has stiff competition. 
The face of a leader with a united team. <laughs> Chris Minns calling on his opponent to elect a new deputy quickly. I suspect the New South Wales Liberal Party is not going to take seriously the advice of the leader of the Labor Party. As senior ministers jostle for Stuart Eyre's now vacant position. I haven't uh, looked at numbers, um, but ultimately this is a democratic vote of the party room. The Premier's reported pick ruling himself out. Why don't you run? I did, I went for a walk this morning, but thank you for asking. As others dig in. I've said to the Premier, I'll make myself available. As Seven News revealed last night, David Elliott will contest, not just because he wants the job, but because he doesn't want Matt Keane to have it. Matt Keane has as many qualities as I have. The question for the Parliamentary Liberal Party is what qualities do they want to prioritise? The Transport Minister and Treasurer expected to also face challenges from Roads Minister Natalie Ward and Dark Horse Alistair Henskins. You're looking for more responsibility as Deputy Leader? Look, we're obviously uh, going to discuss that uh, in the party room on Tuesday. Tonight there's a push for the decision to be made sooner with speculation. The party room meeting and vote could be held tomorrow so the new deputies in place ahead of this weekend's Liberal Party State Council Conference. The sacked minister's portfolios have already been quickly redistributed and absorbed by former frontbench colleagues with Henskins, Ben Franklin and David Elliott carving up Stuart Eyre's collection and Victor Dominello taking on all of Lenny Patinos' responsibilities. Amelia Brace, 7 News. Three people have been killed and a fourth is fighting for life in hospital following a horror mass shooting on a remote property in North Queensland. It happened near Bogie, a tiny town about 200 kilometres north of Mackay. Tonight, the alleged gunman remains on the run. Strapped to a stretcher, paramedics shielding him behind a white sheet. The lone survivor of a mass shooting, a man in his 30s, arrives at Mackay Hospital in a critical condition. The ma was able to tell police that he uh, had been shot and three other persons had also been shot. Sutherland Station, 240 kilometres northwest of Mackay near Bogie, the alleged crime scene where the tragedy unfolded around 9 o'clock this morning. The ma was able to extract himself from the area. Uh, when he was spoken to by police, it was many, many kilometres away from the crime scene. He escaped and phoned for help after being shot in the stomach. When the, uh, the male person spoke to us, he was obviously in a very distressed state. The gunman fled and is tonight still on the run. Police are being cautious, slowly, methodically clearing an area before they move in. You have a rural property with uh, firearms involved. We need to establish our own safety at, at this present time. We do not know who is responsible. A Public Safety Preservation Act was put in place this morning. Police have combed through most of that area and are still searching this evening. Uh, it's extensive at this present point. In time. Seven News understands the property was sold in April last year to a young family. Neighbours say there was a dispute over boundary lines surrounding the property. It's come as a, as a big shock uh, to that particular area and certainly uh, very concerning. Police say the victims are family members and are tonight trying to understand why their lives were suddenly cut short. Rosanna Kingson, Seven News. Cash is back with this week's RBA rate rise finally spurring many of our banks to pay better interest on savings accounts and term deposits. A number of lenders adjusted rates today, including the big four, who've been picky, paying higher interest on some accounts but not all. Self-funded retirees, the Howis, rely on interest from their savings to make do. While mortgage rates rise, theirs barely shift. Very sluggish. It's criminal because they'll put them up in a flash and we don't see any benefit. More than a dozen lenders moved today, including the big four, all passing on the full half percent rise to borrowers. But when it comes to their savers... Whilst I am seeing rates go up on savings accounts, they're cherry picking where they want to put it. Westpac and NAB are passing on the full half percent to all their savings accounts, unlike Combank and the ANZ, only to some. After the Treasurer warned the banks, he expected a fair go. It's a very important profit play, but it's also 
potentially a damaging brand play. And none comes close to ING, moments ago offering a market leading rate of 3.1% on its saving maximizer account, but for term deposits, the big banks are offering rates of 3% for as little as 11 months. It does go back to the savers to not be complacent. Um, you know, you do have to actually move your money around. But for our biggest form of saving, concerns today about where the economy is headed, the superannuation industry anxious about rate rises. Australian super warning the Reserve's aggressive rate rise could cause more harm than good. The Reserve Bank Governor goes too far and creates a recession, they know their returns will be down. One potentially positive sign, some fixed rates falling tonight. Chris Ma, 7 News. China is carrying out live fire drills tonight, frighteningly close to Taiwan, payback for a visit by US officials. A fuming Beijing launched the exercises to counter the show of support for the island's independence. Experts fear it's a practice run that could lead to war. As the most senior US official to visit Taiwan in a generation left, this is what was arriving. In the skies and seas around the island, China putting on a show of force, calling Nancy Pelosi's trip a provocation and violation of China's sovereignty. The White House calling for calm. There is no reason for uh, Beijing uh, to, uh, to turn this visit into some sort of crisis. As Chinese state media beamed out pictures of firepower and personnel. We are ready for combat and able to fight at any time. Taiwan says 27 Chinese warplanes breached its air defense identification zone, many crossing the critical median line before turning back. Taiwan scrambling aircraft and putting its missile system on alert. Posting this video, Taiwan's military says it's watching closely, promising to defend itself. The live fire drills have never been closer. These are Taiwan's territorial waters and these are the areas China says it'll be holding its exercises, which in some places cross Taiwan's marine border just 16 kilometres from its coast. China warning aircraft and shipping to stay clear for the next 72 hours. This is one step short of, of a blockade of Taiwan, and a blockade would be an act of war. With fears of any miscalculation or overreaction at such close quarters. The potential for escalation between Taiwan and China is, is high. The world is watching. We are prepared to manage what Beijing chooses to do. What should come, will come. And if it leads to worse for Australia... What we have to decide as a nation is how we respond to that Chinese threat. Paul Kadak, 7 News. The federal government's under pressure tonight to help open an international investigation into the Beirut blast. This is a live look at the Beirut port two years on from the explosion which killed more than 200 people, including an Australian boy. His mother telling 7 News justice is long overdue. Isaac Olers was a cheeky little two-year-old. Two years ago today, he was in his high chair in his family's Beirut apartment when this happened. A piece of flying glass piercing Isaac's heart. He was bleeding quite profusely um, from his chest. I wrapped him in a towel to try and put pressure on his wound and I just ran um, for help. Delivering him to doctors at a nearby hospital. And that was the last time I saw, saw Isaac. He passed away shortly after after we arrived. Isaac was the only Australian killed in the blast. Yes, that's correct. He was also the youngest victim. Yeah. Sarah, a UN worker, and husband Craig are still fighting for answers. The Lebanese government is nobbling its own inquiry. Sarah believes to hide the truth behind how almost 3,000 tonnes of ammonium nitrate was left to cause such death and destruction. Who do you blame for Isaac's death? Corrupt dealings are what led to this ammonium nitrate being stored there. Um, and led directly to the death of Isaac and over 200 other people. Tonight, Sarah and her supporters are calling on the Albanese government to demand the United Nations conduct its own independent inquiry. And to ensure that there's accountability for victims like Isaac. Foreign Minister Penny Wong today tweeting, Australia is unwavering in our calls for justice and accountability from the Labor local member. That means a credible and transparent investigation has to be undertaken so that there's some level of solace and justice for the families. Posters of Isaac are being displayed on Beirut streets tonight and at home.
Isaac is everywhere in our house. His photo, his portrait, his um, reminders of him are everywhere. Loving, painful reminders of a real little character. Mark Riley, 7 News. Australia's Chief Health Officer is confident we've reached the winter peak of the latest Omicron wave. Hospital numbers are declining but still remain high with 5,000 COVID admissions across the country. <coughs> this is not the last wave. Uh, this is the end of this, this is coming towards the end of this wave or at least peaking at this wave. The federal government has also secured 450,000 monkeypox vaccines as part of a national response to that disease. Ariane Titmus has sealed her place in the Commonwealth Games record books, becoming the first woman in more than 50 years to take out the 200, 400 and 800 metres. The men's 4x100 medley relay team lost out to England in a thrilling finish, leaving it to the Golden Girls to bring home our 25th gold medal in the pool. The finale of a dream campaign. And some happy Aussies in the middle. The defending champions. A star studded lineup out to end the Australian swim team's Commonwealth Games on a high. Chasing her sixth gold medal at these games. <laughs> Emma McKeon's in. The Golden Girls bringing home one last win. The last event. It's been Australia's meet. It's only fitting that the Aussies get it done again. It was another record-breaking night for Australia. The defending champion is the Olympic champion and the world record holder. Ariane Titmus cruising to a Games record in the 400 metre free and her fourth gold in Birmingham. For the first time in more than 50 years, the two, the four and the 800 metre treble. In the men's 4x100 medley relay, it was a race against England and a roaring home crowd. He loves this position. Chasing is what he does best. Kyle Chalmers anchoring his team into a winning position. It's tight. They hit it. England win at home. Just missing the gold at the touch. I can stand proudly and say I gave it all, and I know the boys did too. In the 1500 free, 18-year-old Sam Short wanted Australia to remember his name. Trying to join those immortal names, Kieran Perkins and Grant Hackett, and now it's Sam Short. Shaving 10 seconds off his PB, testing his limits. I didn't want to vomit when I was kept swimming, so I was like, if I had to, I would have. Night after night, our swimmers have performed, delivered and dominated the games. They are heading home with 65 medals, 25 of those are gold. Now it's time for our champions to revel in their success. I've got a month holiday planned with my best friend, Charm, going off to Italy tomorrow. Calling time on a green and gold rush. In Birmingham, Miley Hogan, 7 News. It hasn't all been good news on the track, with Australia's flying mullet Rowan Browning just missing out on a medal, but hopes are high for Peter Bowl, who fought through injury, qualifying for the 800 metres final. It's the event with all the glitz and glamour. He's Australia's flying mullet, among some of the fastest in the world. Got out pretty well, Browning. Zimbini a bit slow, Oman Yali. Browning's right up there at halfway. Oman Yali in front. Rowan can get a medal. Oman Yali wins it. Rowan's just out of it. Rowan Browning was still in the mix with 30 to go. The first Australian in a Commonwealth 100 metre final in 12 years, finishing sixth. If you blinked, you missed the finish. Just 0.18 of a second between our 24-year-old and first place. Yeah, it's nice to make a final. It's a first for my career, so it's a step in the right direction. Just not satisfied by any means, but also not too beat up. The winner, a former Kenyan rugby player. But cameras were focused on the Aussie. It is extremely difficult to make it to a Commonwealth Games final. There's been four now in the last 30 years. The last green and gold on the podium was Michael Cleary, a bronze, 60 years ago. He, he can do the times and he can do well and I'm, I'm very proud of him. The voice of athletics has been mentoring Browning. A few chats about dealing with the spotlight and how to stay focused. He likes what he sees. What do you tell him? Because you've been around athletics for long enough to know what works and doesn't work, right? Look, um, 
believe. And it's the first time really probably since Matt Shervington that we've had a world-class sprinter. We've got another World Champs next year and then the Olympics shortly after that. Even without a podium finish, Rowan Browning writes his way into a slice of Australian sporting history and there are still medal chances to come on the track, including another who made a name for himself in Tokyo. Peter Bowl is back and so is his adoring family in Perth. Watching well, on as the 28-year-old won Peter, his heat in the 800 metres. Everything he's done today has been perfect. After overcoming a rolled ankle. No, I just wanted to get a first good start and then, you know, just switch off at the end. Now the favourite for the final on the weekend. In Birmingham, Hugh Whitfeld, 7 News. And Australia remains on top of the ladder with 46 gold, 38 silver and 39 bronze. England is closing in, now eight gold behind in second, Canada's third, pushing New Zealand into fourth, Scotland has entered the top five. Time to check the weather now, Angie, there have been some wild conditions in parts of the state. Mark, especially in the south around the ACT and Snowy Mountains, here's a look at that system sweeping through overnight and today. Winds in excess of 100 kilometres per hour with falls of 50 to 60 millimetres. This is the current warning area in yellow. Damaging winds and heavy rainfall now likely to impact much of eastern New South Wales. Sydney, though, just avoids that danger zone. The main impact in the CBD has been temperature. There's a lot of warm air circulating with this system. That, combined with cloud cover, led to a balmy low of 17 degrees, the warmest August night since 2009, and the top was 21. There's still a good chance we'll see some wet weather in Sydney later this evening as that system moves away. Tomorrow, though, looking a lot brighter. Details soon, Mark. Sounds good, Angie. Thank you. NRL stars face off, but this battle's well away from the field. Coming up, surprising evidence as former teammates have their day in court. Falling from a moving car, how drivers rush to rescue a child in danger. An old train line to be converted into a bike path through the inner west. Exclusive details ahead. Australian breakthrough, the world first technology to help breast cancer survivors. That's later. And break out the double ticker kebabs as Sydney locals celebrate a big win for a small business. Welcome back. NRL player Adam Elliott has spoken for the first time in the trial against his former teammate Michael Leisha, who police say assaulted his own fiancée, Cara Childerhouse. But Elliott, who was caught in a compromising position with her and was the only other witness, says that did not happen. It was a tryst that fractured a family and destroyed a friendship. Michael Leisha and Adam Elliott had been close teammates for years until the court heard Leisha caught Elliott in a compromising position with his fiancée, Cara Childerhouse. Michael exists, I exist, but we have nothing to do with each other. We coexist. Today, Adam Elliott has spoken for the first time of what's alleged to have happened and whether he was drunk. I don't think we'd be here if I wasn't. The intimate encounter occurred at the couple's Connells Point home after a house party last year. Leisha admits he was angry but denies he assaulted anyone. Elliot was asked if Leisha punched a glass window. I agree. If Leisha punched him in the face, no he didn't. If Leisha assaulted Cara, I disagree. Adam Elliott's evidence is in stark contrast to the case against Michael Litcher. It means the only eyewitness to what's alleged to have happened that night doesn't support the version of events being presented by police. Only the magistrate can decide who's telling the truth. Leonie Ryan, 7 News. It's feared nine workers are trapped following a cave-in at a coal mine in northern Mexico. The country's president has confirmed the Red Cross and military are on site trying to rescue the miners. Relatives of those trapped have gathered nearby, visibly distressed and desperate for answers. The mine said to have collapsed due to flooding and breaching a neighbouring area filled with water. A young child has been lucky to avoid serious injury or worse after toppling out of a car window in China. It happened at a busy intersection, the driver seemingly unaware when taking off. Others were quick to stop, rescuing the child. The youngster was unhurt, with police reminding parents about the importance of child seat restraints. Granted bail but forced to stay behind bars. Up next, why the man suspected of killing Simone Strobel can't walk out yet. A chronic shortage only getting worse. Thousands of teachers needed urgently. Shock result, the conservative US state that's voted to keep abortion legal. 
And ahead in sport live from Birmingham, the silver lining for high jumper Brandon Stark and his inquisitive baby boy, Ollie. Welcome back. Homicide detectives have released security video of two people who may know who's responsible for a double shooting in Sydney's West last year. One victim died at the scene, while the other, who was struck in the head, somehow survived. Rama Osman is an innocent victim of Sydney's gang war. Ever since it's happened, my whole life's changed. The 26-year-old was struck in the head by a stray bullet outside his Chester Hill home 12 months ago. Still recovering, mentally, physically, still got a lot, a lot, a lot of injuries I'm going through. Mentally, I'm not sleeping at night. 22-year-old Shadi Kanj wasn't as lucky. He was shot dead in Guildford shortly after. There was a large volley of shots that were fired that night and the uh, bullets went everywhere. A man and woman seen in this Audi at Lidcombe McDonald's on the same night could help to solve the case. We're not saying or alleging that the, the man and the woman captured in this footage um, are directly involved in the murder. After the Audi left the McDonald's, it was then seen in South Granville, both locations close to the shootings. Because of the locations and the way it's travelled, the occupants of that vehicle would have information that would directly assist us. Residents on Miller Street in South Granville could help too. Detectives believe the suspects came here to Miller Street before and after the murder. It's likely they dumped evidence, including the gun, nearby. Then do it to other people, because they'll come back and buy you an ass. Natasha Squarey, 7 News. More evidence tonight that our teacher shortage has become critical. With more than half the state's 94,000 educators now planning to quit or retire. Their union telling a parliamentary inquiry it adds up to a crisis with claims the government can't do the maths. Today's inquiry brought people passionate about education, like the Teachers' Federation, fired up over... A teaching profession that is in crisis. Ten years of government failure, he says, a chronic teacher shortage, children robbed. Thousands of students every day as we speak are missing out on their learning. 4,000 more teachers needed within five years. Instead, a survey shows 60% plan to leave. Just last year, a staggering 10,000 quit or retired, crushed by the workload. It's not teaching, it's supervised babysitting. Students are already facing merged and even cancelled classes because of the unprecedented teacher shortage. The impact on their education only expected to get worse unless change is made. The union demanding a boost to pay and conditions. So at least we can at least retain the teachers we've, we've got. The government talks of drafting undergraduates. We're very open to ideas that people have about how to improve the issues of teacher supply. But teachers say politicians aren't listening. The denial's got to stop. The spin has got to stop. We need a comprehensive plan to reduce teacher workload and we need to find these teachers to ensure that our kids have the best possible education. Emily Baker, 7 News. In a stunning win for America's pro-abortion movement, one of the most conservative states has voted to keep the procedure legal. Hailing the result a major victory for women's rights, US President Joe Biden says the outcome's a warning to conservative candidates across the country. With abortion on the ballot, they celebrated what seemed the most unlikely of victories. I'm super proud to be from Kansas tonight and I feel like my state just showed up. Kansas voters decisively choosing to keep abortion legal, defying expectations, turnout at polling booths unexpectedly high in the Republican stronghold. Abortion is sin, it is taking a life. Kansas was widely tipped to join 10 states to have already banned the procedure since the overturning of Roe v Wade. This fight is not over. And we saw that last night in Kansas. Seizing momentum from COVID isolation, President Biden signing an executive order ensuring American women needing to travel interstate for an abortion receive the care they need. Women don't face delays 
or denials of medically necessary care. Certainly not lost on the president and Democrats more broadly, the political significance of the victory in Kansas. It's created major headaches for conservatives across the country ahead of this year's crucial midterm elections. The fear for Republicans is if they can't win on this issue in Kansas, then selling their anti-abortion message nationally could be a much tougher ask. In the United States, David Woodward, 7 News. The man charged with murdering German backpacker Simone Strobel in Lismore 17 years ago has been granted bail, but remains behind bars for now. A Sydney magistrate agreed the case against former boyfriend Tobias Moran is not the strongest. Prosecutors have reportedly dropped plans to challenge the bail order in the Supreme Court. An old rail line considered a waste of space in Western Sydney is to be given a new life. It will be revitalised, connecting tens of thousands of residents to Olympic Park. At Olympic Park, behind some fences and danger signs are the century-old remnants of the Abattoirs Line, once a vital connection between the city and industry. Homebush Bay near the city of Sydney. At the Abattoirs and meat markets, this is the week's busiest day. After the abattoir was decommissioned, the adjacent Pepita station was demolished and the line was soon defunct. But its bones are still intact. There's the rickety bit that crosses the M4 and the rusty bit over Parramatta Road. Our vision is for it to be an active transport link so people can walk, people can ride. A two kilometre trail connecting 20,000 Lidcombe locals to existing parks and public spaces. Without having to get in a car. But converting this old rail line into a bike trail isn't exactly a new concept. It was first pitched in 1997 when Homebush was undergoing this massive transformation ahead of the the Sydney Olympics. Obviously that pitch never got off the ground and this site has remained like this, dormant ever since. The study to finally make it happen will be funded by the government, one of 55 projects under its Get New South Wales Active scheme. We are asking councils to say if you have interesting projects let us know, we will fund you. Cutting back on wasted space. Tom Hartley, 7 News. It's the late night eatery labelled a national treasure just ahead, a win for the little guys and how a community rallied to keep the doors open. The loss of a sporting legend remembering champion Aussie boxer Johnny Famichon. A world first here in Australia, how 3D printing could be the future of breast surgery. Suit in Sport live from the track in Birmingham, your first look at Benji Marshall in his new role as a coach. And grey skies with showers still lingering tonight, but a better day ahead tomorrow. Details soon. Welcome back. Taking a look at finance now, and the ASX 200 has closed just one point lower at 6,975. Stocks in bigger cheese rose more than 7%, while buy now, pay later company Zipco's shares fell nearly 7%. Nearly 4%, sorry. And one Aussie dollar is currently buying 69.61 US cents. Australia is mourning the loss of sporting legend Johnny Famichon. The boxer rose to fame following his match against Cuban Jose Legra in 1969. He also defended his world title twice and was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame. But in 1991, his life was turned upside down, suffering a brain injury in a car crash. I think a state funeral would be warranted. He died this morning, surrounded by his family, aged 77. One of Sydney's most iconic eateries has had a win for the little guy, having its opening hours extended after Wallara Council cut them short. The Indian family diner in Paddington is celebrating tonight with hungry fans ready to re-enter its doors. The moment of celebration for one of the city's best-known eateries. <laughs> Tonight, the Indian home diner in Paddington, cooking with gas again. Its opening hours clipped by Wallara Council. Punishment after the eatery was caught trading into the early hours. Owner Robert Chowdhury. I feel so proud, I believe me, I feel so glad, so proud. 
the people go live, they help me, you know. In the restaurant's hour of need, loyal patrons served up a feast of support, a campaign to restore late night trade. And I'm very exciting, you know, that my, I'm waiting for my people, you know, they're always asking me, Robert, when we do open the late night. The council now allowing the fan favourite to stay open until 3am on weekends. Tonight, small business on top. It's really great that the uh, owner was able to uh, resume trade and I think that's a win for Oxford Street. Over the years, the Indian home diner has become a staple on the Sydney foodie menu and thousands of people have come through these doors. The old... One of my favourite haunts on a late night, or in fact any time of the night. And the new local MPs call themselves diners. Allegra Spender labelling it a national treasure. But whichever way you look at it, this is a win for the little guys. Everybody, please come and try the cover number five or number seven. Liam Tapper, Seven News. <laughs> this next story goes to show you can find love after loss, even if you're a dingo. Wildlife keepers at the Australian Reptile Park have done just that for Fred, whose mate of seven years, Adina, died in May. Keepers introduced Fred to Tani, and they're now inseparable, sharing their favourite rock to sunbake on. There is a bit of an age gap though. Fred is 10, while Tani is just three. It's a common procedure for thousands of women, but the way breast surgery is performed could soon change. How doctors are using 3D printers and your own fat to create breast implants without the traditional silicon implants. Don't miss that story soon on 7 News. But now to Birmingham and Mel with Sport. Hi again, Mel. So close and yet so far for Brandon Stark. Hello, Fergo. Yeah, you're right. Hampered by that painful foot injury, Stark came up agonisingly short of back-to-back -back gold medals in the high jump. More from the Commonwealth Games is, of course, up next, including the popular powerhouse with a ton of charisma and strength to match. Meet our newest bronzed Aussie. And the Tiger King in waiting gets down to business, coding his coaching skills with some Tiger Cubs. Welcome back to Birmingham where our Javelin World Champion Kelsey Lee Barber is free to compete this weekend after recovering from COVID. Brandon Stark narrowly missed out on defending his Commonwealth Games high jump title battling a painful foot injury. The 28 year old Sydney sider was beaten on a count back. At the friendly games, <laughs> getting to share the joy with loved ones means the world. To be able to do with them and here comes Brandon with his kid as well. So. Um, it's all the fathers out here doing well tonight. Para sprinting great, Evan O'Hanlon dominated his class of the 100 metres while reigning high jump champion Brandon Stark with a bruised heel pushed through the pain barrier. Yes indeed, he's still in the hunt. Stark lost to Kiwi Hamish Kerr on a countback but got to soak in a gutsy silver with son Ollie after the toughest competition of his career. It was pretty painful, hasn't been the greatest year, been a couple injuries um, but to kind of top it off off with this, um, yeah, I'm pretty happy. Izzy Bat Doyle was eighth in the women's 10,000 metres, another event that typified the spirit of these games. The Scots have won. What a famous victory. Eilish McColgan crossed the line at the same time as Mathakane Letsi. The only difference was Letsi still had three laps to run, while McColgan basked in the glory of a Commonwealth record. Three gold medals at this event between them. The 30-year-old from the tiny African nation of Lesotho fought to the finish, lifted by a roaring crowd. Certainly not the only huge cheer echoing across the game city. For the Aussie with the most charisma of all, it's our lovable larger-than-life weightlifting super heavyweight. With fans eating out of the palm of her hand, Charisma Amoe Tarrant, a silver medalist for Nauru four years ago, won super heavyweight bronze for her adopted homeland. I'm proud to be Australian and I'm also proud to be known, so at the end of the day I'm representing both countries, you know, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> at Canic Chase Forest, stacks of stacks in the mountain biking. And we'll see if it's snapped off or he goes down. No, it is. He did go down. When really struggling to get up there. Zoe Cuthbert, nicknamed the Flying Raccoon, looked destined to miss the podium, but charged home to snag our first silver in the sport at a Com Games. Oh, take a bow, Zoe. What a fantastic ride. I know everyone at home stayed up late and watched, and it means so much to me. And I could imagine you guys there as I was racing, cheering me on. And it felt so good. In Birmingham, Matt Carmichael, 7 News.
Benji Marshall's coaching career is underway tonight in West Tigers heartland, although he doesn't start his senior coaching apprenticeship until next season. The Tigers grade is putting a junior team, appropriately known as the Cubs, through their paces. Coach Benji. They run at the mat speed, make them flip your fingers. At the moment, it's probably just like that. Tonight, the Tigers superstar is coaching the club's under-16s, or Cubs, at Campbelltown Stadium. Preparing to begin his apprenticeship under Tim Sheens from next season, Marshall takes over as head coach in 2025. But if his coaching boasts as much flair as his amazing on-field career, current Tigers can't wait. Spent some time playing first grade with him was um, pretty cool. Always seek advice on my personal game off him. Um, I reached out to him after a few games and um, just see some tips he can give me. He was brought up through that through that era where he had like um, not bullies, but like it was tough love. He came came in the other week and he told me I was in a ball playing lock, and it kind of hurt my feelings, but it was true. <laughs> So I'm back in the front row now. The Tigers train for Sunday's clash against Newcastle without Jackson Hastings. Teammates are angry that Pat Carrigan will only miss a month for his hip drop tackle that broke Hastings' ankle. For him to come back after four weeks is, yeah, I, I, I think not fair. Commission Chairman Peter Volandi has told Tigers bosses today there's no chance the result of their controversial loss to the Cowboys will be reversed. Legal action remains a possibility. We were left with the distinct impression today that the NRL has no appetite to intervene and overturn the result. So we have to determine ourselves as to whether we're going to take it further and if so, to what extent. Michelle Bishop, 7 News. There were tantrums and a spooked spectator as Nick Kyrgios continued his US Open build-up in Washington. A stray Kyrgios backhand return hit a woman in the head, but she was unharmed. The Aussie apologised, giving her a towel. Like they did during his Wimbledon final defeat, Team Kyrgios copped several tirades. Opponent Tommy Paul beaten in straight sets by some outrageous stroke play. The US Open is only three weeks away, Fergo. 15 gold medals up for grabs here, including plenty at the athletics and a couple of real, really serious Aussie contenders in the cycling time trial as well. So look out for it. I will be watching, Mel. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thousands of women receive breast implants and undergo reconstructive surgery only to suffer complications. But now a new alternative to silicon has been discovered, with the world first surgery happening right here in Australia. Theatre nerves aren't only the patients. This surgery's never been done before. Moena Staunton is the first woman in the world receiving a new type of breast implant. The first procedure has been an enormous success. Using what's come off a 3D printer in Germany. It doesn't look like it, but it's five years of work. Uh, a lot of uh, high, highly sophisticated engineering concepts in here. It's made from material used in sutures. Surgeons inject the woman's own fat cells, which grow. Within two years, the initial shape dissolves. All that's left is natural tissue, creating breast implants without the implants. Silicon implants have their wrists when we're implanting them. And long-term problems, pain, leaks, shape loss and a lifespan of 10 years. Every implant will fail eventually. They hope not this one. Because a woman's going to have her own tissue. The next surgeries will be performed on women who've had cancer in the first phase of trials to prove it's safe. From breasts to bones, doctors are now working on what's next for the technology. It's hoped it'll be used in facial reconstruction and other plastic surgeries. Combining engineering and medicine to help patients around the world. Michelle Jensen, 7 News. Now Angie's back with the forecast and the grey skies should lift tomorrow. Mark, a brighter picture in Sydney for our Friday. Next I'll take a look ahead to the weekend forecast as well. Tonight's 7 News headlines, it's been revealed a girl is under investigation with claims she was at the centre of a Bankstown school stabbing. Bushfire hero Shane Fitzsimmons and his team at Resilience New South Wales are facing the axe over failures in the state's flood crisis. A gunman remains on the run after a shooting on a Queensland cattle station left three people dead and another person fighting for life. And our swimmers are off for a well-earned break after one final golden night in the pool in Birmingham. Now here's Angie with Sydney's weather. Thanks very much, Mark. It's been pretty grey today, but under those clouds, also unseasonably warm, especially this morning. We dipped to a low of 17 degrees, eight above average. From there, temperatures only climbed a few degrees to max out at 21. Tops mostly reached the low 20s across the suburbs. 23 was the warmest. That was at Mascot and for Cronulla. Plenty of rain inland. 
though Sydney mostly avoided the wet weather until the last hour or so. We're just starting to see showers pick up now and they'll continue tonight with periods of rain possible. The really severe weather is just skirting around the metro region though. Warnings take in most other eastern regions in the state with these yellow zones showing damaging winds and heavy rainfall and that situation remains tonight. That should all start to ease tomorrow morning as that system tracks north and offshore. However, by tomorrow night we could see a second front lead to more damaging winds limited to the state south. Given that it's still a pretty grey picture for the southern capitals, wet weather for Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Hobart and Canberra. Brisbane avoids all that fine 26 degrees, cloud clearing in Darwin and a top of 31. Statewide, it's looking mostly fine in the far northwest, but much of the state's inland will continue to see showers. Showers too just edging into the state's north coast, but from about south of Newcastle, it's clear skies with above average temperatures. Wollongong heading for a top of 21 and 20 at Batemans Bay. Across the metro region, winds again tending northwesterly. So another mild night, 12 degrees at Penrith, 13 at Blacktown, 15 for Bondi. Tops again in the low 20s, we'll see 22 or 23 degrees for most centres. And skies will be clear, so it's a nice day ahead. On the water, winds will tend northerly at first, up to 30 knots. Uh, becoming northwesterly before dawn and easing to 25 knots. But wind warnings again cover most marine areas. We're looking at strong gusts for all areas except for the far south coast. Back in the CBD, a low of 13 degrees, another warm one. Daytime conditions looking nice too, a top of 22 under blue skies. Ahead, conditions remain fine for the weekend, although it's not going to be quite so warm. Back into the high teens for the CBD, up to 20 in our west. The working week brings the potential for some very light showers. They'll generally be coastal only, not likely to amount to much, so still plenty of fine breaks to enjoy and temperatures all sitting fairly close to average for the working week. Not too bad, Mark. Tomorrow looking great. All under control, Angie. Sure well is. done. That is 7 News for this Thursday. We'll have updates for you throughout the evening. I'm Mark Ferguson from all the team. I hope you have a great night.